Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the cloud-based authoring tool for e-learning. Learn how your team can work together better at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. Ah, good morning, everybody. Any weather reports coming in today, Chris? Oh, not in the chat yet so far, except for those of us here in Ottawa and Eastern Ontario so far. It's um, it's a great day. There's actually some snowflakes falling outside my windows. Uh, not going to lie, I'm not happy about it. But anyway. Oh, Joe says it's almost sunny in her area of the UK. So that's you know, isn't that a comedy series that's almost sunny in the UK? Isn't that something? <laughs> it should be. <laughs> isn't that? Uh... Well, it's, it's almost sunny in Philadelphia, though. So there we go. <laughs> and speaking of Philadelphia, um, we have Jolt Ola with us today, who is in Philadelphia, and that's why that's resonating for him. Um, Jolt, you've been with us here before, but uh, there are folks who probably ha- are joining us today who haven't met you. So, so what? Uh, Tell the crowd a little bit about yourself. Hi, hi everyone. Good morning, afternoon, night, wherever you are uh, with your coffee. Um, cheers. Um, no product placement, but Wawa is a good good one to start if you're in the PA area. Um, so my name is Joel Dola. I'm a I'm senior learning technologist at Amazon, um, two and a half years or so uh, with Amazon. And I have a engineering computer science background, so I can sit down with you down to the code level and you know, geek stuff, and then switch over to the other side and have talk about creativity, vision, learning games, that sort of thing. And that's been, I think, my um, career for the last 20 years or so. Uh, so much fun, so much fun. Yeah. Um, it's always cool to have, uh, to hear what people's, um, you know, sort of original backgrounds are. Um, because very few of us end up in this industry, you know, by a direct path out of um, high school into a college program and then into this biz. We've always we've all got something else that we that we that we yeah. bring to this and that that set of reflections. Exactly. It's an awesome strength, um, you know, because you can always find people who, who can help you and, and resources, et cetera. So, yeah. Um, and we're, we're kind of we're bringing that both of those aspects of the. Uh, I'm going to say both of your personalities together today in, in our conversation, <laughs> um, because we are talking about data literacy uh, for learning leaders. Um, you, in the green room, you were mentioning, oh, when people say data literacy, um, it probably brings back a little bit of, you know, maybe PTSD for some of us who had to, you know, struggle through statistics courses or those kinds of things <laughs> back in the day. I would imagine this is like a, a nightmare from high school. You're running in a field chased by Greek letters, and you have to very quickly uh, calculate the probability of survival. <laughs> and you're only armed with a baseball bat. Um... Yeah, and you see a normal distribution. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we love it. Survival on the bell curve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you're an outlier. <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh, man. Good. The puns could go all day long, right? <laughs> yeah, good. Um, but, but, but really, I mean, in our learning space, we're dealing with data all the time, um, whether that's kind of the things we expect from our LMSs, you know, completions and, um, and assessment results and, and those sorts of things, et cetera. And, um, I think many people may just kind of assume that they know what they're doing with with different kinds of data, et cetera. But um, what what is it that we that we really need to know and to keep in mind as we're thinking about all this stuff that comes floating past us in Excel files and, and various reports and things like that? Yeah, so that, I think the data literacy part start with the word itself, data literacy. I know that it hurts some feelings. Um, <laughs> there's been all kinds of LinkedIn back and forth with that because. It sounds like you don't know anything, like you don't know Jack, um, and we know everything, and I will tell you about data and all that. The point is, you can call it anything you want. So this is my starting point of it can you can call it dumb, jumbo Jack, cuckoo clam, whatever you want. Um, the point behind it is that 
before you start measuring things, before you start talking about how I'm going to show the value to the business, before you start creating dashboards, you have to have a baseline of A, um, your team needs to speak the same language, speak the language of your stakeholders, but also internally, and then understand what the data comes from, how to sort of lean it, and how to understand it. And so data literacy for me wasn't, with my team, wasn't about stats only. That was a little bit of a stats in it, but it wasn't about stats, about how do you think about data? How do you not jump into the trenches and try to solve right away things that you think you're doing, but you're actually solving for the wrong things? That's that's sort of the, the part of data literacy that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And we want to know how... Um how we can get folks to get a better understanding of that because i think um in our industry like we you were saying that that we we used to do butts and seats and that used to be the joke and that we needed to go deeper and do better and have better data and better analytics but where do folks start when they're when they're first starting to think about data literacy in you know like maybe it's an instructional designer that wants to talk about it with their manager or they want to talk about it with stakeholders i mean typically how do, how does it come up like how does how does it normally get going because i know you've talked to other people about this stuff this isn't the first time you've you've jumped into this right <laughs> <clears throat> yeah i think for our team when i joined the team actually it's a i think it's a very typical story i i joined the team where they were on the road to to show and work with data more, to tell the story of what the data says and tell it in a way that it's valuable and actionable to stakeholders. Because that's one thing that um, they, they already had in mind, they had a vision, they had roles um, in that. They was also thinking about how to say no to the business if it's not valuable, because that's one of the skills that we usually just put aside and we just try to please the business, of course, because this is how we get paid. Um, but unless you have a strategy around it of, or a criteria of, hey, this is why I say no, or this is what you get out of it, and this is our value, then it's hard to say no. And so this was the, the sort of stage when I, I joined. And first thing we, we understood is that we need some sort of a framework um, in order to measure anything. So Kirkpatrick is the, I think the number one, everybody is, is knowing if you, if, even if you go anywhere, no matter what side of size and shape, you need to know the four levels. And there are teams at Amazon who use, are using um, Kirkpatrick. Our challenge was that we needed something more practical to start with moving away from one end to another. And so we actually landed on a different approach um, called LTEM. Actually, I can just pop it into the um, into the chat quickly. Mm -hmm. LTEM is the um, learning transfer evaluation model. And again, if Kirkpatrick is working for you, um, here's the link in the chat. If Kirkpatrick is working for you and you can measure things and tell the story and the business already on, on, on board, then don't change anything. What we did was a couple of things. One is we need a framework so we can speak the same language. And with LTEM, with these tier approaches, um, what we actually showed the business is that if you ask at this level, on this tier, we can deliver. But our confidence to tell you that the actual learning is going to happen is low. The actual confidence to this learning is going to be applied on the job is very low. And then the performance is like zero. And so we asked the business, as we talked about it, is how do we make sure that we, we measure the right things? And if we do want us to measure things like what we call, you know, um, those vanity metrics um, that blocks your mirror while you're driving, things like how many people completed the course and in and out, that you can do that too. It, it's not like it's bad, but that's not enough. And so that was the starting point. And what we realized is that before we get there, before we start measuring and have like strategy around it, we need to understand how to use data, what sort of data we can use, and then what we can and cannot say. And this has kind of led to this little um, exercise that I did last year. It was a specific learning data literacy program for a whole month. And so it's a journey for individuals. They started at the same place. 
that they went their own routes, basically an adaptive way of getting through a story and using those um, data literacy concepts. So rather than having this, what you share on the screen as let's memorize and talk about the tiers sort of thing. And so show designers look at it like, okay, I know these things, fine. But let's start with a pilot. Let's start with a project that's done. You can see the dashboard and you decide whether this was, you know, a criteria was, is it scalable or not? Like something actionable and tangible. Mm. And so that's how I created a fake project, fake data, fake everything for them, but it looked absolutely real and have a conversation around, okay, what do you see on this dashboard? How do you not fall into traps, that sort of thing? And that's the starting point that I suggested, having something that, that people actually use, the entry point to data literacy, rather than books and, and all that um, to start. Once they have a buy, like, oh, now I understand why 4.4 satisfaction doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> but now I wanna know more, and that's when you can give them resources. Yeah, David is mentioning in the uh, in the chat. One problem is that people measure that which is easy to measure, regardless of importance. The easily measurable item becomes the criteria for success. So, yes, uh, smile sheets come to mind. <laughs> oh, so that's a good segue, by the way, because the other thing that we did, we sort of ditched the I mean piloted, but we sort of ditched the original one. You know how satisfied are you, and do you like the course, and that sort of thing which we know that it's not predicting anything per se. Um, it, it's a great feeling. That's why it's a vanity because um, it gives you a good fuzzy feeling that people like your course. Um, in fact, there's uh, as always showed them this study when they had two exact same courses. And the only difference was that they gave out cookies, homemade cookies in one. And then the result was not only better satisfaction, but perceived learning 20% plus on that one because of the cookie. So if you're in doubt, just hand out cookies. Back to the, <laughs> back to the question. Um, so what we did was we piloted this, uh, and this is Will Talheimer, um, again, replacing the generic questions, the Likert things into very specific things. So instead of asking, you know, how satisfied or how um, do you think you're gonna use this on the job, one to five, we actually give them specifics around what to expect when you do the transfer. And we can mm -hmm. see their confidence, but also more like, like a self-efficacy sort of approach of, do you even think, do you even see yourself doing this? And if not, what would be the barrier? If it is, what sort of resources can you see yourself using? Because then you can see like, if people are coming for the course with, I'm an expert, I can do this, then you know that they're overconfident and you might have to support them one way. If they come out and say, I'm gonna able to do this because I'll have resources checklist, but you never designed any checklist, then you have a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, jump out of the plane. Well, we didn't pack any parachutes, sorry guys. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I forgot that memo. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I, I'm uh, I'm sorry. I was um, I was trying to find Will's book on uh, mm. on on uh, on smile sheets. He's got it's a great called, uh, book. So performance I'll just... performance. Um, there's like an actual physical title of it. Uh, performance focused, I think. Um, survey that sort of thing. Yeah, something like that. I can I can't I can't find what it is. I'm sure somebody in the chat will find it and drop it in for us. Hint hint. Wink wink. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who's not also trying to watch uh, everything happening in the actual show too. I know. Um, no, we've had we've had Will on several times, and and, um, and have always uh, he always brings something um, to every every discussion we've had, uh, and we certainly oh man we value. I've relied on so much of his uh, research work in different projects too. So yeah, so if you can, gang, find that uh, and yeah. uh, take advantage of it for sure. Yeah, find him. Yeah. Um, Kim's noting in the chat, we discuss and propose data analytics and measurement during the needs assessment. If we don't tell the story correctly, the learning solution is rejected or altered in a way that won't produce actual learning. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so we, we sort of talk about the data side of things and the measurement side of things, but there's also a component that I'm also sort of responsible for in my role helping the designers and the managers is that we not only just set out and measure these things, but what we also change how we design things. 
And it's actually a um, interesting thing because just by thinking of measurement, you actually change up how you design because you design for how you're going to be measured. Mm. And what yeah. it looks like today is that if you if you are measured by how many people complete the course and how they like it, then you create something that's very engaging. And it could be a funny script in it, a little music, animations, AI generated character, whatever those things are. And then you get clicky, clicky, results, bling, bling. Whatever it is, you know, <laughs> like, or games that excellent. I loved it. I just don't know what I learned. Um, or a month later, I remember this great thing. I was jokes in it. I forgot what the title was because you didn't even know what the topic was. And so I got, that's, I got that's a short like, back. I got 800 right? points, but yeah. I don't remember how. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's the problem with, with measuring the wrong thing than designing for it. And so we also have uh, the designing part, our learning design part, and that could be any process that you use as long as it's going backwards. Uh, we have in Amazon, we have our own version of that, but you can use like Kathy Moore's action mapping, anything that starts with the business goals and then going backwards from there. Because as you sort of chain those back to the learning part, you have already a better chance that when it goes backwards, it actually have the, um, the right links to that rather than mm -hmm. starting with, okay, needs analysis, what do you need to learn sort of thing? Because that's another thing that, when you talk about the business goals and problems with the business, they talk. SMEs, if you go to the SMEs, like, what do you need to learn? You get a bunch of content. Um, here's all this PowerPoint, and here's all these SOPs, and all these things that they're it's in their head now. But if you ask them about, okay, tell me what's happening today, what sort of problems are you see, what mistakes are making, then you're going to like, what do you think they make these mistakes? Like, can we see them doing these mistakes? Can we find the, the patterns in them and then go backwards from there very specific? What, what kind of um, pushback have you experienced, if any, on, uh, on taking this route of focusing on the data and understanding it? So starting with, um, there's a very good book. Um, I don't have the link to it, but I'm going to find it because I forgot mm -hmm. that link. But, mm -hmm. uh, but actually, the data literacy comes from Jordan Morrow. Um, he has a great book on be data literate. And what I, what I like about that book is it's not about the stats per se, and there's the basic data classification that you need to know. But other than that, it's about your hats, um, that you wear. And so he came up with these three C's. Um, I added the fourth one, and this is my session was at ATD technology uh, conference this week, uh, this year. And it's basically how to be curious. So how to ask this, what questions to ask, how do you get deeper into the conversation around what's behind those um, elements that you're looking for the data, how to be um, creative sometimes, because that's one pushback is, oh, it's hard to measure, well, let's not measure anything. But it's not a, a you know, a, a zero sum game, like you either do it or not, um, you start somewhere. And sometimes there is no measurement. So I'll give you a, a simple example of um, how do you measure, for example, in a bank, I work with um, supervisors, and they were wasting time because they were answering questions that the new hire should have known. There was nothing around it. You can't measure it. It wasn't like, okay, I'm wasting X amount of time, and let's reduce it by X amount by the end, like the smart goal sort of thing. And so creatively, what we had to come up with, how do you measure this that sort of as a proxy that shows the result if we get to move that needle. It's like, I was like, it's like a temperature. You go outside and you see it's, you don't see the temperature. It's not like, look, oh, it's 80 degrees. So we need something that shows the temperature, but it's not really the heat temperature. And that's why we made up thermometers or whatever, because it's actually an effect that is correlated to um, the heat out there. So it's the same. Sometimes you have to be creative with that. And my, I think, Favorite one is just never assume anything because you have all these biases going on that nobody wants to talk about because the data biases that we love. And one one of these things is basically the just confirmation bias of you go and seek out what you want, you ignore everything else, and you prove that your your perfect learning course worked well. You never actually consider that part of it may not, 
to never look that data part. You're only working like this is what I'm going. This is what I'm going to prove. And so in that case, what happens is that when you bring some exciting insights from data, and everybody agrees with it, because you know leadership said like this course is great for managers, and you prove them they're great, nobody cares. Excellent, great job, promotion, move on. If you bring in something like, hey, the data says that it's not really working for like new managers under two years, then you get all kinds of questions. How did you collect the data? Was it really maybe just a coincidence? Like nobody, nobody accepts it because they don't want that. And this is what you need to prepare for that it's not what you present, it's how you tell the story and how do you make actionable insights that people actually do something about it around that. Yeah. So that's a lot of of, of no when, oh, I don't think that's true. <laughs> Yeah, and why can't you just go ahead and uh, it, sometimes it's hard when you push back. We've had conversations around um, saying no and pushing back and asking more questions, and yet sometimes you'll get the old, uh, can't you guys just make a PowerPoint and just be done with it? <laughs> why do you keep asking all these questions? <laughs> yes, uh, and so now we have generative AI, and that's – but I told my team last year that if if we are focusing on of how fast can we create content, then we're going to lose very quickly. Because if you walked into the business and say, look, I can create the perfect course in six weeks, and I guarantee that it's going to be at least 90% effective. What it means, I don't know, but it sounds good. Or you can have this AI create that in overnight or in an hour, but it might just be 80% there. Which one do you want? Like, show me that business that says, like, let's just wait six weeks and, and see how your course up is. No, it's, yeah. it's not going to be like that. No. no, give us the 80%. We're good with that. Give us the 80 because, you know, because we know we're living in a world when not only six months or six weeks, but you never know what happens next week. Um, a yeah. lot of change happens very fast. So iteratively, if you can change anything now, this little 1% maybe, um, success today, it's better than a potential two birds in the bushes in like six weeks. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's what makes all of this very, very complicated um, from from our perspective, right? I think a lot of folks got into our industry um, just wanting to create a course. And I think we kind of um have done this to ourselves right it's it's not sometimes we like to blame it on the people requesting it but i think a lot of times it comes from our side of the of the table too where people are like why can't i just create a course i mean i'm i'm really good at creating courses why can't i just keep doing that you know why why do we have to complicate things so much and yeah. you know nobody nobody people don't really say that but in a roundabout sort of way i get that sense from uh, a lot of uh, a lot of folks in the industry that's exactly actually i posted this i don't know by a couple of weeks ago on linkedin that when i started i didn't really care about the end results and you know impact on the job and all that thing i was down on the chain uh, can you make this content very, uh, you know, experiential, immersive, exciting? So I use the tools yeah. to make it really creative, and that was my. I love that. Um, yeah. I think my mind changed when I actually saw delivering these things or people taking these and working, doing their job. Um, like in call centers, when I visited the country, and I realized that all oh, these people don't need this at all. All they need is just another monitor. And and that's it, because their problem yeah. wasn't like they're not following and they're learning, they're memorizing. It's just there's no way to switching between applications. So just give them a monitor, and then they can see the two and then work. And and I raised my hand like, hey, can we do this? Like, oh no no, that's expensive. And I was like, blah blah blah. And this is where it started this conversation in my head about so how do we convince them that that we're not just training at the end of a project. Because what happens normally is that mm -hmm. someone somewhere creates a project timeline and at the end they push and they're going to have training for two days and then they're going to be, you know, great performing. Mm -hmm. And then everything is pushing and all that. And then finally the training comes and then learning comes in with their knowledge and they don't have time to even ask any questions. 
it's like, oh, we need this tomorrow. We're already ready. We already, back in the days, like booked the room. They're ready. You just need to train them. Yeah. Well, where's the software? Well, it's not done yet because we have parts that are not working. Can you have a screenshot here and there? Uh, but it needs to launch. And so we taught the business that we are really creative. We can make more with less and all these like slogans. We can create content very quickly and we deliver overnight and that sort of thing. And it all because we never measured the impact. If the yeah. business knew, that the impact is not what just happens in that day, but the problem that's going to happen on the job, um, then maybe they would have a, a different opinion on it. And this is where sometimes I don't make friends um, in the L&D industry, because when I, when I say, when the moment you give up the illusion that this new higher training is going to teach people how to do their job, then we can sit down and figure out how to make it actually work. <laughs> and then they say, well, then this basically tells the business that we've been doing this for, I don't know, 10 years and it's not working. Like in, it really <laughs> means saying that, hey, we're not doing the right thing. So my take on this, like, it's not like we're not doing the right thing. With the circumstances, we were doing the right thing, but we could do better. So it's, the problem is not that you're not there. The problem is I'm not moving anywhere. The same with data literacy. It's right. not that you don't know median and normal distributions, and you don't know about why is it dangerous to have a mean all the time and base decision on those. The problem is that you're not moving from that sort of status to, I know more about it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mark's got a good question in the chat. Uh, any suggestions on using a data-driven strategy when selling courses? that uh, to external customers whose LMS, LRS won't report back to yours? Um, I'll be honest. Um, I've never sold any courses in my life, in my 20 year career. <laughs> so I'm probably not the expert to answer what to do with the selling part. And, um, but that reminds me, I think more of uh, the two data um, approach one is when you're internal and one is when you're not and that could be selling courses yeah. or you're a consultant when you're internal then you build a long-term relationship so these data driven conversations coming over time and then you can actually get even that is hard to get into the, the results because the business sometimes like to hold on to whatever they have because everybody has you know agenda egos uh, projects time whatever but when you're outside, if you're a contractor, contract, contractor, <laughs> a contractor, um, you're selling courses. So when you don't actually see what happens after the course, that's almost impossible to, to get that data. Um, but one thing that I do suggest um, is, and this is where learning technology and learning design and science come together, is that you need to put in the right thing in the design in the first place. So instead of saying that this course is excellent and you know it's very creative, you can tell me what were the strategy to be creative for who, the audience could be different, but here are the five things that guided us. And if they are grounded in learning science, then I can probably believe more that it's gonna be an impact yeah. um, than others. So that's one. The second, but that is more like the learning sort of you know, business doesn't really care about learning science generally what they care about is how much time people <clears throat> have to spend on this thing and what do i know when they um using it how, how what has the impact so i think case studies and that sort of thing would be interesting and, and nice to know if any of the um clients are volunteering for that doing some sort of thing like hey here's was before here's how we purchased and implemented, and here's after. Now, whether it's really causal effect, um, that's another big story um, to get into. But at least you see something changed, and then might be that that uh, the starting point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think to go along with that, it's it's interesting when you're talking about selling courses. I I think you know to your point to try to sum it up a little bit. I mean the the whole data literacy part comes in 
for the internal folks, right? When you, when you have that relationship with the stakeholders, with the different departments that you're supporting, but where the purchased products come into the game is when you're wanting to speed up your efficiency within your organization. And there are some generic knowledge points that maybe an off the shelf course gets everybody leveled up to a certain space. And then what your department is responsible for is figuring out a way to get those data points with your stakeholders and add some extra learning or an extra experience like the game experience that you were talking about, right? Put them through a simulation where they can take that knowledge that they learned and their real world experience and pull them all together and, you know, and learn. And then yeah. you can, as an internal person, then you can make that connection between the business and the work that they're doing and what they learned in sort of the generic content course, but then also in what you added as an internal employee to tie that to the business. And you can see all of those connections. And I think you could make a really, really strong case for that um, that that hybrid uh, sort of solution. Yeah, so again, like, I don't know, I don't know about the selling part. Um, it's also hard to sell something that, that you don't know the culture um, when it gets into and placed into. Um, yeah. And you don't know, basically the the audience um, part of it because it, it's never like we need sales training there are no average salespeople. everybody is different they have their skill set different so as long yeah. as uh, that that just a generic thing i don't know maybe one thing that i could speak to that that we use this like 80 20 percent sort of ratio of we could provide teams 80 percent there in that structure and we guarantee that the design is working well, but they need to plug in their 20% excellent uh, case studies that's relevant to them. So things like, I know yeah. how to solve, uh, for example, people picking up a phone and they need to help people like agents on the phone. I can create good exercises, um, feedback mechanism around that, uh, role plays and social elements, but I'm not gonna tell you what the exact scenario is right uh, that's so what i'm saying yeah regions, you got to build that channels, as the internal you person plug in your, yeah. but i'll give you guidance uh based on science what should be in that so don't create something like multiple choice questions and the longest the answer is right and it's obvious because they're not learning anything um yeah. although this changed my mind when some of the things happening in the us in the supreme court that i take i take ethics training every year um and i would probably fail right away if i did something like that uh that, that might happen <laughs> out, out of the scope of this conversation but again like it's 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 how nuanced and relevant the scenario is that, that that matters and then the structure around it of how you discuss it how you how, how, what takeaway you take from it and application wise then you can apply that but i would say that unless you do it at home whatever your organization is first and see the result, I would not venture to sell this to someone else yet. <laughs> yeah. Because in theory, data literacy is simple. Measuring is simple. We have the levels. What happens though in reality is that it's not so simple. Because then you have to talk to people of who owns the data, what sort of data comes in. Then you don't have enough people to sign up. So there's a lot going on. You don't have time. In reality, it's more complicated than what I think generally we all agree on. Mm -hmm. that in theory works. Mm -hmm. But I guess it does start with that data literacy though, right? Back back around to where we started, right? Getting everybody to at least understand it and doing something similar to what you did to help people learn it by putting them through a, a bit of a simulation or a, or a game type activity that, that actually helps them um, you know, go through a real life situation and realize by going through the the game that um, that the the importance of having the right data and the and the information yep. and not but not necessarily needing to know all of the technical details of data so people don't need to be freaked out by the math and everything the statistics behind it. You just need to know some some basic things to make it happen. It's um, so this is what. Our internal thing was again three 
week, four weeks long, um, continuous and adaptive and all that. So you can't just take that and just put it somewhere else like, hey, do this. But when I, uh, I did a session on ADD technology um, this winter, and what I wanted to test out is if I bring in random people, put them at a table, um, can they apply these things in an hour uh, based on a fictitious pilot dashboard? So to make it very simple for them, that's why I created the dashboard itself. It's a basically, a, you can make a six fold game board. Everybody is looking around, see the dashboard as it would be on the screen. And then I created data cards for them. So it wasn't just, okay, here's the dashboard, go and find out whether it's right or wrong. But we went one by one and the team had to discuss about each data card based on what the dashboard says, but it's true or not. And that's when the learning was happening between them because they disagree. And the conversation was around, no, I think this is why, oh, but have you thought about that sort of thing? So it started with a practical thing that matters to them. And then I just simply came back and said, okay, this is why this was true or not. And if you want to know more about data classification and why it's not continuous, blah, 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 then we'll do that. Here's some resources. Let's move on. So the, the, the idea was not to teach every little data type that you do for four years when you go to class and statistics, <laughs> but understand the big traps and then have some ideas and resources on how to move on. That was the well, and the only feedback I got was funny because um, I always get like feedback on one end, like this is the greatest thing, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, this is just not what I expected. And it was boring or whatever. The only bad thing got the people who were sitting in the back and didn't have a table because it was overflowing. And I told them to go away because this is not a presentation. It's like 80 percent of the stuff happened at the table people talking and discussing things and making data. So you're not going to learn anything when you sit in the back. But. <laughs> did you um, did you bring cookies, though? That's the. <clears throat> um, no, that I didn't didn't. Um, actually, I don't <laughs> like uh, chocolate chip cookies. I'm one of those freak hmm. people that I, I remember one day my daughter, and my my wife made homemade chocolate chip cookies. I walked in. I like the smell, but I don't like the cookie. So I put <laughs> jam on it. And I was banned for a week from the kitchen. <laughs> nobody puts jam on fresh homemade chocolate chip cookies. Uh, I, but I did, I did, uh, I did make all the hats um, for that. So wearing those okay. hats, the four C's, I had actually a real hat. So some you know, visual representation of this, but no cookies. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, the challenge with cookies is then you have to make sure that you're um, you're in line with data privacy laws. Mm -hmm. Boom. <laughs> um, anyway. Hey, Chris, we're getting close to the end here. Um, pick a pick a question from the from the Q and A for me, real quick. Which one do you think is a hot, a hot one for us to address, real quick, yeah. or something well, from the chat? What do you think? Well, there was a question, and um, I mean, first off, Jolt, you're doing that same session again at the uh, ATD Ice, right, in May? Yeah. So, if anybody is coming um, to ATD Ice in San Diego in May, um, it just bump it into mm -hmm. into the chat. And we're doing the same session, uh, a little bit twisted uh, based on what I learned from ATD technology, but the same type, um, being the dashboards, um, teams, and deciding on um, the approach. So if you're interested in what it looks like and feels like, and maybe it's something that you want to build for your team as an exercise, um, then definitely come and um, see. Because it's not just uh, the experience itself, but I meant uh, for this session to be, is have a feeling like is this something that would work working for you or not and then i have online resources of how to build these things so how do you come up with fake data that you want i mean today probably you can use chat gpt4 if it's allowed <laughs> at your organization um but i have other tools too that actually you literally put in what sort of data you want and it creates the spreadsheet for you so it worked mm -hmm. up backwards very cool. And, and Greg's also asking uh, in the chat question, was this a presentation or a learning event? Don't worry, Greg, we'll be sending you the smile sheet to follow up uh, <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> it's whatever you want it to be. Did you learn something today, Greg? Then it's a learning event. <laughs> uh, so I think one thing that I do want to emphasize, and I did in the session too, that, that whole all this learning data literacy 
analytics on top of that and and then the measurement if you're not planning to do anything about it <laughs> if, if if you're just recording these things on a dashboard then don't sweat it like just build it whatever you do today unless you're actually planning to make act you know do actions follow-up actions and insights and see um what sort of change you make again like it's not worth it um it's just reporting out and that's fine yeah and again like there's no right or wrong here it's just you need to understand what your end goal is and that is to make change rather than being right all the time which sometimes we like to be that we're right i'll tell you well it didn't work fine <laughs> Indeed, going from indeed, data indeed. to doing oh hey there you go there's a blog post title for you there we go <laughs> <laughs> some great stuff doing uh, the data your data to doing something like that it's, oh it's, which, maybe it's which, a song uh, yeah. <laughs> i was just going to say it, it echoes our green room conversation about da 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 uh, the trio. Anyway, everything comes full circle. Da, da, da. Da, da, da. <laughs> Is that the German version? <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Man, bringing Very back cool. all sorts of memories there, now. There, there have also been a lot of links um, in the chat to different places where you can also, you know, learn more or, or up your data literacy level too. So if you um, if you happen to be listening to this and ver of this episode in the audio podcast of what we do here, Instructional Designers in Offices Drinking Coffee. Don't forget to check out the blog post at www.domino.com. That's D-O-M-I-N-K-N-O-W.com. We'll have the blog post up with those links, um, as well as the recording up later today. Um, yep. Looking forward to look forward to, to checking all those sorts of things out. Folks, what we get to do here um, and Instructional Designers and Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino Learning Systems. We can help your team do some really cool stuff, um, particularly around uh, not just authoring content, but uh, helping that content be propagated throughout your e-learning ecosystem, he said, dropping in a buzzword. Um, we've got some, there's the link at the bottom of the page, but I'm also going to drop a link into the chat here as well, if that's something that's of interest to you, perhaps something that could be helpful for your team. Indeed. Don't forget our LinkedIn group too, Brent. Do we um, do we have that one, chap? Can I, we got that, that one handy. handy, so handy that all I have to do is push a button. There Buttons you go. Push. Yeah. Hey, thanks again, Joel. It's always fun to see you, my friend. Thank you for uh, having me. I put my LinkedIn link. Find me. Excellent. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much, gang. Great chat as always. Next week.